Well, good morning. Glad that you're here. Hello, theater and uh, South Hills. South Hills, you're with us, joining us today. So we're glad to have all of you with us. Um, before we move into the, uh, the message, the last of the series for Undo, I want to just give you a quick update. Last week, we had a, a really important vote. We did a vote on, on uh, getting permission to move ahead on purchasing the Jack in the Box lot. That vote turned out overwhelmingly positive. Um, first time we've done a vote over at South Hills campus and simultaneous with here. And so thanks for taking part of that over there. And so thank you for that vote of confidence that allows us now to move forward. We're going to uh, be purchasing that lot and we'll let you know we're, we're already meeting with uh, some people and setting up other meetings so that we can kind of find out what can we do, what will the city allow us to do. Um, and uh, we'll let you know how we're going to pay for it and um, also how, what we're going to do with it. So that'll be coming um, in uh, just probably a few weeks, you'll start to hear some more stuff about it. Also, those of you who, who um, are diligent enough to pray for uh, anybody that's on staff or leadership here during the week, I'd like to encourage you, Finney and Susan Abraham, they have a brand new baby boy named Johan. Um, he's about four months old. He was supposed to be born on my birthday and he missed it, but otherwise. But anyway, um, but that little boy has a problem with his heart. They've taken him into the hospital now twice and uh, they'll be deciding what to do mostly to, um, tomorrow um, as they start to run some other things. And they're not sure if it's a valve or a hole or what else going on. And so if you could pray for little Johan, that would be great over the next few days. Um, and let's pray together. God, thank you for the opportunity to come together, for um, the use of technology that allows us to be at several places now together. Would you bridge those divisions that would somehow cause us to drift away, either distractions in this room or in other rooms that would rob us from what you want to do? We want um, to have your will accomplished here among us as if it were in heaven. And we want to also just pray uh, for little Johan. We pray, God, that you would allow the doctors to have great skill in knowing what, how to move forward, that you would move with healing, and that little boy would come to know you at an early age and have a long and healthy life. We also think about Asia as this month we're praying for uh, that continent and, we, and the coronavirus that is, as it continues to spread and take lives. God, we ask that you would bring containment to that virus and that you would move in a strong way to protect lives. Now, as we open your word and we gather together, would you use this time for our good and for your glory, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. We have come to the end of this series on the seven deadly sins. That's what this was essentially about, seven of them. And, and it can feel... Um, as we work our way through this, if you're, at least it feels a little bit to me and uh, to Dana as we were talking, it can begin to feel like a behavioral management series that we're, you know, that stop this and then come back next week and we'll tell you what else to stop. And um, that is not the heart behind the commands that go along with the, the vices that we've highlighted. And it's also, what we've tried to do is, is, um, bring um, some awareness to some of the practices, some of the spiritual disciplines that have been part of uh, the church's history for thousands of years and how to engage in those in, um, in this day and time. This week is lust, now, the last of the seven deadly sins. It is the, um, the one that no one wants to preach on, so it always falls to me and Dana and... Um, <laughs> And it's the one that right now, even as I talk about it, you're, you're, some of you are building up a resistance to it. And you're probably asking things like, well, Christianity, why don't they just let it go? I mean, it's, it's clearly the least popular teaching of the church. Just let this whole sexuality boundaries, let it go. Haven't we advanced enough in our own culture that we can recognize that it's just an expression of our emotions and our feelings that we're hardwired to be sexual creatures and that we, from a Unitarian point of view, we just we need to be able to express that and be free to do it. Can't we finally just agree that 
The only morals needed around sexuality is that it's private and that's consensual. Isn't that enough? And the, the teachings of the scriptures say no. It is not enough that there's at least one more moral that needs to be part of it. And it's in the context of a commitment, a covenant between a man and a woman for life. That yes, passion deepens love and certainly intimacy uh, motivates it and causes it to grow, but commitment protects it. And that the scriptures know how we're made and the power of sex and has set guidelines around it not just how we act, but how we think. And lust is much more about how we think about each other, how we view one another, what we allow to go on in our minds. Anthropologist Helen Fisher, who got famous on a TED Talk when she did a talk on why we love and why we cheat. She was talking about some of the things that are going on inside of our body. We've listed it on... Uh, inside of our body when we have sex. We've listed it as one of the resources that you might wanna go to on the back of your handout. Um, and there's a lot we could, this needs to be having more than one week, um, but we're not gonna be able to do that. And so we've given you some resources to kinda of go to. But this is what Helen Fisher said. There's no such thing as casual sex. Sexual climax releases a rush of certain neurotransmitters and hormones. The neurotransmitters in the, uh, of dopamine intensifies the sensation of romantic love, while the hormones of oxytocin and vesopressin uh, deepen our emotional attachment to the other person. Stuff is going on chemically that allows a bond to happen and to treat it as some kind of just a transaction between folks is, is, to, is to cheapen how we're created, what God has designed in us, but it is also to put our souls at risk. To cheapen the act of sex and to dam and to, is to, to put ourselves at risk in terms of damaging what is going on inside of our own soul is so much more than a transaction. Sex is not an expression or a search for something that is missing. As you understand sex, in a biblical context, it's not a search for something that is missing. It's the expression of something that's been found. The connection, the intimacy, the love, the commitment. Yes, the covenant that one person has made to another. And that is in there that it is supposed to be mostly expressed and most, most of our culture is being shaped not by an understanding of sex that involves the whole person and the beauty that God has created into it. The truth of the matter is, is that by far the most powerful force shaping human sexuality in our day is pornography. It is pervasive in everyone's lives. You cannot escape it. You cannot escape it. The truth of the matter is, you view things, if you're, if you're very old, you view things now with no thought of what you're viewing that 10, 20, 25 years ago you would have never watched. It is just sliding into how we dress, how we talk, how we look at one another, what we think and the expectations that we have in our relationships. And unfortunately, I've been able to see this corrosive nature of lust gone wild firsthand. I have sat across the table from Christian leaders who have in tears confessed to me that their, less, their lust was left unchecked and they finally acted on those thoughts in such a way that they have blown up their opportunity to do ministry, the thing they have trained for, the thing they are gifted for, the things that they have dreamed about doing for years is now completely taken away from them. I've sat across living room tables and coffee tables and had couples just, just in tears express to me how because they let lust go unchecked, their marriage is blown up. It's like someone threw acid on all the trust and all the compassion and all the kindness that they have for each other because they have let this sex and lust go wild. 
I've had coffee with singles who have just talked about the frustrations and, and some of the, the challenges of what it means to be single in this day and how they have embarked on this quest of trying to find what our culture says is out there and how now they walk with the kind of shame that says to me, they've given away something that they intended to keep and now they can never give it back. Never get it back. I wish it were just second and third person that I've experienced this, but I grew up in a home where lust went wild. I had a father who could not be trusted. He was a slave to his own sexual desires. My mom tells me that when I was about three or four, maybe five years old, that she was taking me down the street one time in the car and I told her, mommy, that's where daddy's girlfriend lives. And that lack of trust, that lack of honoring the commitment that he had made to uh, my mother eventually blew our home up. And my mom was left to raise five kids by herself. And you'd think in that kind of environment, seeing that kind of damage, I'd grow up on the straight and narrow. But to my shame, I can tell you, I've also sat across from my girlfriend in high school who's missed two periods and is late and asking ourselves, what are we going to do? What if she's pregnant? How are we going to handle it? I have experienced the shame of going after I became a Christian, said I wouldn't do that kind of stuff, and then doing it again and allowing lust to just run wild in my own life. I have experienced the kind of shame that when I go before God again and say, I can't believe it. I cannot believe I allowed myself to do this again. And the shame and the damage and the lack of power that was in my life, it just, just was taken away because of my own hypocrisy, my own inability to control my lust. It's not our intention to kind of make you feel a bunch of shame. This is the topic that no one can feel proud about. Our thought lives are always just one little tick, one little picture, one little vision, one little experience away from being carried down some horrible path. That's, we don't want to do that. But it, Jesus is intensely involved and aware of the power of our thoughts. And he's intensely aware of what it can do to his children. In Matthew chapter five, we have the beginning of the most famous sermon of Jesus. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. It's also the longest sermon that we have recorded. Um, chapters five, six, and seven all represent the Sermon on the Mount. And basically what Jesus is doing in this sermon is he's taking an opportunity to redefine for people who are following God what life in the kingdom will look like. He takes several of the Ten Commandments and says, you've heard it said that it's supposed to, you're supposed to live this way, but I tell you it's even different than that. He kind of redefines for us and re-antes up what it means to be a follower of him. Six times, at least six times in this sermon, he will say, you have heard it said, but I say. And he redefines just what it means to live in the kingdom of God. That it is not, and over and over again, well, here's how he redefines it. It is not simply what you do. Jesus did not come to establish a higher um, behavioral management, sin management program. In each of these commands, he's gonna say, it's not just about behavior, it's about thoughts. It's about what's going on in your head. It's about how you view people. He talks about anger and revenge and stealing and whether you tell the truth or not, keeping covenants, love for enemies. And here in verse 27, he says this about adultery. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I can still remember the first time, well, 
uh, the, what I believe to be the first time I ever read this. I don't think I ever saw a Bible, read a Bible until I was a Christian. And they, the advice I got was skip the Old Testament for now and start in Matthew. And when I got five chapters in, I was like, what? I mean, I somehow knew, somehow I knew without reading the Bible that I was supposed to stop having sex with my girlfriend, but stop thinking about having sex, <laughs> right? <laughs> Are you kidding? I mean, it seemed unreasonable. Why would Jesus want to get that much exercise, that much control over my life? Well, it was because he understood that to look lustfully, to and the word there is epithemeo. It means to covet, uh, to set your desire on something that's not yours. It's a word that's used not just for sex. In Luke 15, when the prodigal son is hungry and he longs to fill his, his belly with the food of the pigs, that word for longs is the same word for lust. In Luke 16, when the beggar Lazarus longs to fill to just eat the crumbs that fall from the rich man's table. That word for longing there for food in both of those chapters is really the same word for lust. So we can lust for all kinds of things, but since we've already in this series talked about envy and greed, we're gonna use lust to kind of center around the sexual aspect of it. Jesus somehow knows that if we let this run wild, it will damage our soul. It will somehow compromise the way we view the opposite sex, that we'll, we'll spend our time looking at people as objects that we can use for our own fulfillment rather than seeing them as image bearers of God himself. And that that kind of a view towards one another, it's impossible. Listen to me. It's impossible to have an authentic, genuine Christian community with someone else when as you're looking at them, you're filling your thoughts that they are there just to meet your desires. They only exist just to satisfy your needs. You can't have all, you can't practice the kind of Christian life that, that Christ calls us to if you're always thinking that. You see, Jesus wants to talk about what we think and how we think about each other because he cares about us that much. There's a better way. There's a better way. And so asking the kinds of questions like, how far can I go? How much can I do? What can I view? How much can I look at? Those are all bad questions. Because it's not taking the other person in consideration. So we want to, we knew that to talk about this, I, I have a particular view towards things and how I kind of go at lust and, and try to do battle with it and set up guards in my own life. And, and a lot of y'all will relate to some of how I do that, but a lot of y'all wouldn't. There's, there's a lot of people that would not approach it that way. And so we knew from the design of the series that Dane and I would do this series together. And so that she would come up and express kind of some of the things that are going on for her. Not only are we different in gender, we are different in personalities. We are different in energies of how we approach things. But this I know, and I am convinced of, I'm better with her. In every way. And so I... I've asked her to do the hard work. If you think it's really easy to get up in front of hundreds of people and talk about sex with your spouse, hey, that, this is not really our idea of a really great way to spend the day. Or the last week. Or you last can week. You imagine that. Yeah, but. that too. So, uh, um, but thanks for coming up and being willing to do you it. Bet. You bet. I'll just be right over here. Yes. He'll come back up in a few minutes. But... Um, as even as Steve was talking this morning, I was thinking about one of the things that he talks about a lot is your thoughts. But for me, the thoughts, when I think about it, it reveals my heart. And that's why Jesus says this matters so much because our hearts reveal like who we really are. And as we look or think about others, we want to realize that they don't even just belong to themselves. You know, the world says, it's your body, do whatever you want. It is not your body alone. You were created by God. 
You are his. You belong to him. And so he has something to say about what is best for you. See, so much in our times when we, when we talk about our sexual desires, about our lust, we're, we're not trying to damage anybody. We're not, we don't set out to damage another person or to damage ourselves. It's just a desire. And we move towards that desire for physical pleasure. But the thing of it is, is it does damage us. And it does damage the other person, even when you say, but we love each other and we're okay with this. God says, I have a plan. And the plan is that it's in a covenant relationship of marriage. And that's the design, even though that is so difficult. And it's really easy for me and Steve to stand up here as an almost 40-year married couple. But we know that this struggle for each one of us is a battle, especially in the culture that we live in today. Our hearts, when we think and use sex for our own pleasure, or even just for the pleasure of the other person, it's a disordered attachment to a good thing. Sex becomes an idol oftentimes, especially in our world. It's an idol that everyone deserves. But it's not. That's not what God says for us. God has given us a desire to be loved and accepted, and oftentimes we can use sex for trying to get that love and acceptance. And that's just as wrong as we're still using someone else for our own desires and needs. And so we have to begin to think, as Steve said, what are the kinds of questions that we want to ask about what kind of person do I want to be? What does God desire for me? And we need to look at our sexual desires through that. And we need to realize and understand that for every single one of us in the room, the first answer to this is that God is the one who wants to fill our desires for love and acceptance. He wants to be first in our life to give us the things that we need. He designed us in such a way for us to have that intimate relationship with him first and foremost. And then secondly, it's with people in our lives. And sex is only one aspect of that. That's to be within the marriage. The rest, we need to long and look for relationships with people where we can have that closeness and intimacy, not just with the opposite sex, but with friendships that we can develop to where we have the safety to be the real us and to be known and to know others in such a way that we can talk about the struggles and the, the desires and the passions that we have. And wrestle with it together and say, this is hard. But it's worth the battle for the kind of people we want to be that love and follow after God. And so Steve's going to come back up and we're going to talk about some practical game plan kinds of things. But as we look at even this, Steve coming from a coaching background and he was a defensive coach for a football team. Oh, you're there. You showed up. I was like, I thought you were still way back. No. Uh, I'm not finished quite yet, okay? Oh, right. <laughs> But he has a, that background of a coach, and when he comes up with a game plan, he's usually thinking about what not to do, how to stop things. But they're also in a game plan, there needs to be an offense too. And it's, it's what do we do to develop to be the kind of people that we want to be? And we're going to talk about that. But I also want to say that in Steve's own life, as he talked and shared about his struggle from his past, I mean... The first time he ever looked at porn, it was like third grade, something like that. So it has been a part of his life. But I knew him back when he was in high school. And I, I've seen the hard work that he's done, both defensively and offensively, to change 
those behaviors and those thoughts and those patterns and the way he viewed people. And it, yes, part of it was setting up boundaries, but I know the first part for him was falling in love with Jesus and wanting to be different because of his relationship with Jesus and then making the effort and the change for that. And then secondly, our love together and his desire to honor me in such a way that I never had to worry about these kinds of things. That is an offensive and a defensive plan. And so, come on up now. May I come forward? Yes, you may. <laughs> We're ready for, I'm ready for you now to come forward, so. Fantastic. Yes. So, this game plan is going to be both defensive and offensive. The first one would be to make a covenant. And we, if, it's, if you want to think about it as a defensive plan, you're going to make a covenant um, about what you allow yourself to think about and view and see. Um, Job chapter 31, Job says in the, in the, in, towards the end of his book, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust upon a young woman. He just decides, and if you're a gal, it's young man. It's, it, he just decides at this point that he's, he's going to make a covenant where he's going to limit where he goes. There was a book written many, many years ago called Every Man's Battle. and had an excellent section in there where they called Bouncing Your Eyes. And they said in that book, the first look is free and the second look costs. And this idea that you would just decide, it's, it's one thing to see someone and say, wow, they're really pretty or they're really beautiful or see that thing that you would really like. That's nice looking car or nice looking house or whatever, but then to bounce it and not allow your eyes to stay there and to feed into what becomes really now more of a mind of what you're doing. And you would not only make a covenant to bounce your eyes, but you would also starve your mind. Listen, the... the it, the whole idea of what you constantly put inside of your brain, that is going to be where you're going. This affects your dreams. Me, Dana and I were talking about, we're watching a series and it, my dreams have started to be affected by this series. Violent, violence. Violent is, series. It was that dream. <laughs> <laughs> so I've gotten a few punches in the middle of the night. So I'm like, no, we're not I mean, watching I'm that active. Anymore. I'm active. In my dreams, I'm, I'm <laughs> okay, and I'm winning. <laughs> but you would just begin to, uh, to decide there are certain things that, if the images that if you see them, listen. I remember Dana and I were walking into an airport, uh, and um, as we did this um, several years ago, before people like carried dogs into the airport and all that kind of stuff, there, somebody came through with this entourage and they had like two or three dogs with them, someone carrying their dogs for them. And, and I was like, I knew this had to be somebody. And we were down in LA, so mm -hmm. it, it made sense. And then she, I said, who is that? And she told me it was some famous movie star that I didn't really, I mean, I said, who, what, what did she play in? And she told me, we had seen it. So I said, wow, never would have recognized her. She looked different. Different. <laughs> With a... Thank you for that. She looked, uh, she was not that glamorous, beautiful woman that you see on the screen. And when you allow those images to just dominate and begin to define for you what beauty is, what sexy is, what responsive to you might look like, listen, those people are fake. Nobody, nobody is that horny. Nobody. All the time? Are you kidding? Nobody's that pretty. All the time. And if you allow that to be, become your measure and not something that, you, you're, that you're with and it's real, then you'll suddenly start to put out unrealistic expectations because you have just been lazy about what you allowed to be in your mind. But it's not just that, it's too, it's, it's setting boundaries of where you're gonna go and who you're gonna be with and how much time you're gonna be alone if you're in the dating world. I know all of this is really difficult, but if you have to make predetermined decisions on what you're going to do, because if you wait, 
to make the decision till you're in a moment of desire, you know what kind of decisions you're going to make. It's difficult enough when you're not in that time. But you have to make those determinations and, and then set up some boundaries, set up some guidelines, set up some accountability so that you actually become the person you really want to be. That's what you really want, but it's so hard to make those choices in the middle of, of times when you're feeling differently. Listen, every computer that Westgate owns, there's accountability software on that computer. I got a report this morning from one of the pastoral staff's computer, and it told me where his web browser has been all of the last week, how much he was on it, where it went, what he viewed. Someone got a report from me, not from me, but from the software of, that told that person everywhere I'd been, when I was on it, what I viewed. That computer right back there has accountability software on it. Every one we have, you're thinking, well, nobody's gonna look at porn in the middle of the worship service, are they? No, they're not. And if they do, we'll catch them. We don't trust you. We don't trust us. If, you've, if your plan is just to stop and be better, you better have more than that. You better have some hard accountability systems in place so that you can actually live the kind of life that, I'm not telling you what to do, but if you decide this is what you want, you better have a plan for it because it simply doesn't happen by willpower alone. And that leads you to the next part. Yeah. You also have to get a team. This is the offensive part of it. It's not just about what you don't do. It's what you do and what you move towards. And you move towards those kind of relationships that are intimate, not sexually intimate, but relationships that hold you accountable, that love you, that know you, as I talked about earlier. It's difficult to do. I was talking to one of our younger staff members earlier in the week, and he said, here's one of the problems, is my generation does not know how to do face-to-face -face relationship. We do it by our phone. We do it by our computers. We do it by texting. We do not know how to do that. And when you talk about those kinds of relationships, we freak out. We get anxiety. We are scared because we don't know how to do it. Here's the thing. That's what God designed us for, and we have to move towards that. We have to find ways to have a team around us. So how might, what that might look like? Well, it's the same thing we talk about all the time. A small group of people that you get together regularly, that you begin to develop relationship with and talk about the things that matter in your life. Is it scary? Absolutely. But it is necessary for us to do these kinds of things to be able to be the people we want to be. In that, there is accountability. In that, you begin to say, I'm struggling in this area and I want to set up some boundaries. But I know what I'll do. I'll just take the software off. I'm smart enough to get around it. Whatever it is that you might be able to say, but someone else holding you accountable and saying, how are you doing on that? Who knows you and you want to have a deeper relationship with him. It's important to set up a team. Maybe you start not with the smaller group or maybe you already have some friends that you know. But, but you, you take a step towards a group that is in your area. So maybe it's the young professionals group. That's a little bit larger, but you at least step in the water to say, what would it look like to begin to have people around me? One of our meetups in the summer where you're not isolated, where you're not alone, where you have the opportunity for your heart to grow towards people as God designed us. And this is, this is hard work. This is the harder way to do it. So you've got to be smart about the kinds of people that you give this kind of permission to. They've got to be trustworthy. They've got to be able to, to hold things confidentially. Of course, all of those things. Move slowly, um, but determine that you're going to find a group of people around you that want to live like you say you want to live. And then hold one another to that. Now listen, as we talk about this, there's no condemnation 
for those who are in Christ Jesus. I don't know what you've done. I know all of us, or probably almost all of us, are, are not, a, we're ashamed of some of the things we've done. I know you're thinking, well, you guys are old. Y'all, y'all got this already. It's something in your rear view mirror. We ain't that old. <laughs> um, so as you do this, we move in this idea that there's no condemnation in Christ. There is, in fact, forgiveness. And we're going to move towards that just for a, a few minutes here in the service. Because if we're going to make changes, we have to know how God feels about us and what he, how he forgives. We have to move towards confession. So the spiritual practices that are going along with lust are accountability and confession. And there's a podcast that will be out this week that will take you for a longer version of this, but we're going to take just a few couple minutes here in the service to move towards this. See, if you are going to make any change at all, you have to first agree with God that you belong to him. You are not yours alone, that your sexual life is something that he has control over. You need to agree with him and understand the reasons that he has set this up within a covenant relationship. And you need to begin to, to want to change and to make a, a, a movement towards him in this. Don't run away from God in this. Move towards him in your sexual relationship, in your struggle with lust. If you desire to make a change, even sometimes it's, the, as Mark said earlier, the want to want to change. God, I, I'm not really there yet, but I want to move towards you in this. That is, is repentance. But it's also confessing where we've been and, and what we've done in the past and seeking his forgiveness in it. See, sometimes it's easier for God to forgive us than it is for us to forgive ourselves. But you need to know and understand that forgiveness Cleansing is available from him. And you need to move towards that and to receive the forgiveness and cleansing that is available in Christ. So we're going to take just a moment. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures during this time. But I ask you to bow your heads with me. And just as you are, are just in this moment to say, God, is there anything that I need to confess in this area where I'm not taking it seriously enough or I know I've blown it tremendously and continue and I'm not even sure I want to change? Is there something that God wants you to bring to, to him? Psalm 32 says, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Psalm 65, 3 says, Though we are overwhelmed by our sins, you forgive them all. Isaiah 43 talks about how God will blot out our sins and will think of them no more. In 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. be clean you can be pure you can be changed but we need to bring it to God our service is going to end with a time of communion which is a perfect picture of God's great love for you His desires for your very best. 
And so Jesus came to pay for our sin on the cross. And that's what this time in communion is about. It's that reminder for uh, those of us who are in Christ that his body was broken for us and his blood was shed for us so that our sins could be forgiven and taken away. But not only sins forgiven, we can have new life in him. New life to begin again in all of the places where we've blown it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for being our Savior so that we can be a part of the family of God and be restored in the newness of life in you. Thank you that through the power of your Spirit who lives in us, we can change and be different.